day. And I, I made a, an executive decision, like I said, that um, we would continue on with the study of John Shelby Spong because uh, the book that we had just read, uh, John Shelby Spong, uh, this is the guy that we're talking about right here. Well, it's not working for me. Um, Whoops. Yeah, that's him. Uh, John Shelby Spong, former bishop in the Episcopal Church, a very uh, prolific writer. I think he's this is his 24th book that he's written. Of course, he's he is gone. He's no longer with us. Uh, but the last book that we read, he was um, uh, doing a very close reading of Matthew. And, and what we do in this this book study is we we look at scripture typically uh and apply what are known as the historical critical tools of 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 inquiry uh how was the text written by whom was it written to whom was it written at what time what were the cultural and and social circumstances under which it was written um so we don't uh we don't look at the bible from a a, a faith perspective, nevertheless, I don't think it's counter to a faith perspective, but it's not a devotional perspective that we are uh, following here. We are, if I can use the word, uh, you know, uh, looking at scripture from a scholarly point of view. And, and you know, when I was in seminary, uh, one of the the quips that was often heard was, "Well, that's the best way to to ruin your faith is by." you know, taking an intellectual approach to the reading of the Bible. And there were, I, I would say, half of my seminary class just opposed this, you know, reading of the text. Uh, because, you know, we'd spent a lot of time reading Greek and we'd read Hebrew, you know, for the, uh, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and then we'd apply the tools of literary criticism to a reading of the text. And, and it was you know, it was dissecting something that a lot of people held to be very dear to their heart, right? And they didn't care about when it was written. They didn't care about what the social circumstances were. They just wanted to preach the gospel. I, on the other hand, uh, I just really, I really tapped into the historical critical reading of, of scripture. I did not think, and I think Spong would agree as well as many others, like like your two pastors, our two pastors at First Pres, Greg and Damon, that it can open up much about the text that can be uh, supportive of and uh, a nurturing of the faith, uh, the Christian faith. Uh, but it does require a little bit of, uh, uh, well, it it, a little bit of more critical inquiry than is is often the case. Um, so I was talking about how we have just finished reading the book by John Shelby Spong called uh, Biblical Literalism, A Gentile Heresy. And what Spong was doing is looking at a very, very closely at, at the Gospel of Matthew and asking all of those questions that, uh, you know, uh, a critical biblical scholar will ask, you know, who, who wrote this text? Well, how was it used? What were the circumstances under which it was written? And Spong arrived at the hypothesis that he develops throughout that whole book, that the Gospel of Matthew was used as a liturgical text in the context of the Jewish synagogue in which there were followers of Jesus claiming that Jesus was the Messiah. So in the synagogue, as they were going through the whole liturgy, and what happens in the Jewish synagogue is, you know, you, you read the Torah over the, the course of a year. Uh, but for those who believe that Jesus was the Messiah, reading of the Torah also had to go hand in hand with trying to understand Jesus in, uh, in a new kind of context, you know, that the kingdom of God has arrived. So how do we place Jesus uh, in uh, this new faith tradition. And Spong says all of Matthew can be read as a liturgical text that supplemented the reading of the Old Testament, or what we would call the Hebrew Bible, uh, in the early centuries, or excuse me, in the early decades of the church. This was probably written around um, 
the Gospel of Matthew was probably written around uh, 85. Now, most of you who were through that went through that um, that reading with with me and uh, with all the rest of you. Um, you know, that's that's where we've been, and you know that fairly well. But while I was going through uh, the book of Matthew, I was thinking to myself, uh, what what are we going to do? What happens with the book of John? <laughs> you know, and Spong must have been thinking of, the, of that too, as he was writing his book on, on Matthew. Because when you get to the gospel of John, uh, it is just a different, it's a horse of a different color, as they say. So, so today, what I'd like to do is just go over um, what we know about the four Gospels and how it is that the Gospel of John fits into, uh, you know, the, the, the four Gospel tradition. Um, but before I get into that, I, I do want to ask, because everybody made arrangements to buy the book. This is what it looks like right on the front page, right, right there next to John Shelby Spong. Lynn's already got it. Yeah, good, good. Um, I don't want to assume, oh, here's Gaylene's popping in. I don't want to assume that you've already started to read it, but uh, what we'll talk about today is something that is probably a refresher and a review uh, for some of you, but then for others, uh, it will be maybe new material. But um, whenever somebody writes a book, they always have to state a problem, you know, they have to recognize that there's a problem that they want to address. Uh, and this is Spong's final text, uh, I believe. Is that correct, Mac? Uh, I want you to correct me. I think this is the yeah. last book. No, oh. actually, I think the order is he wrote this book right before he wrote the book that we just concluded. Oh, you're kidding me. And then after the book we just concluded, he wrote Unbelievable, which was his last book. Ah. And he says in the, in the fourth gospel that this is probably my last book, I think. But then he went on to do two others. Oh, so. <laughs> okay. Well, then I'm getting the chronology wrong. Uh, but I, believe I'm, I believe I'm right. I mean, I wouldn't bet the farm on it. But I think if you look in your copy of, uh, of, of uh, Christian Heresy, you'll find that this was written right before it. Okay, good. Well, it won't it won't matter one way or the other. It's nice to have that the uh, our reading of Matthew as a as a text to to make some some comparisons. Um, but if you read the preface of this book, well, Galene is getting admitted again. If you read the preface of this book, um, Spong really uh, has a little short paragraph that I would describe as a credo, and an I believe statement. And John Shelby Spong is known as probably one of the most progressive, you know, biblical scholars and theologians uh, in the 20th and 21st century. He really challenges a lot of people. He challenges the church. Uh, and the, the unique thing about him is, is that he, he really tries to deconstruct some things that he sees are problems, but he hasn't given up yet. He has maintained a, a, a faithfulness to the tradition that he knows so well. Uh, and he, he talks about this in the preface. He said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Christian. That's the paradigm I know. I don't, you know, I, I can't just drop it all and become a Buddhist. And that's very wise because um, many people believe that, you know, you can just adopt another religious tradition, <laughs> uh, you know, just like uh, today I'm going to uh, you know, profess these new set of beliefs. Uh, and it's not simply about professing new ways of, of uh, believing because every religious tradition carries with it a, a, its own kind of metaphysics, a, a, its own kind of understanding of the world. Um, for example, there are many people today who say, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm Buddhist. I really, I, I'm quite a Buddhist, you know, and uh, well, there's a lot that comes with claiming to be a Buddhist. And, and I would say that most of them uh, 
are really living in a Western Christian paradigm and trying to adapt and adopt Buddhist principles in that. And Spong very wisely says, and you know, I'm not, I'm a faithful person. I have a spiritual life. I'm not going to give up on Christianity, but I'm really going to put it through the ringer. I'm really going to challenge, um, you know, the things that I see as, as problematic. And just by way of uh, review, one of the things I think he sees as most problematic is that the, the turn that the church made in probably around the middle of the second century. Uh, this is where we were reading about the Gentile heresy. When they started to, the apologists of the church started to adopt uh, Greek philosophical ideas to, you know, to, to respond to their opponent, opponents who were already, you know, highly uh, immersed in Greek uh, and, and Roman um, uh, rhetoric and, and philosophy. And so whenever you take on the categories of your opponent in a debate, you've already lost the debate in many ways. Uh, but this is what the early church fathers did. They started to apply Greek philosophical ideas to God, uh, to Jesus. And Spong wants to make the point He's not so sure, his point is, he's not so sure that these ideas were actually present in the mind of the founder of this tradition, Jesus of Nazareth. He argues for a very Jewish understanding of who Jesus is. If we really want to know Jesus, we have to understand his Judaism. Everything that comes after that uh, really muddied the waters. And so, I think he died when he was about 82, 83 years old, maybe older, I don't know. But by that time, and it's really a beautiful uh, credo that he has in this preface. I'll probably just read it to you because uh, he lays it out pretty pretty well. And, and if you know Kim from his previous book, you know how well he's re wrestled with some of these ideas, but I've wrestled, and I'm on the, the very first page of the preface, and I guess that's uh, Roman numeral nine down at the bottom of the page, last paragraph. I've wrestled with the Christian faith for all my now 82 years, and I find myself at this moment to the surprise of my traditionalist critics, I'm sure more, I'm sure more deeply committed to my Christ and to my faith than ever before. Uh, and here's where the whole historical critical tradition of reading scripture and asking questions, and by the way, in good Presbyterian fashion, even though Spong is an Episcopalian, uh, he's part of that uh, humanist tradition uh, in progressive Christianity that that tries to seek out these answers by using reason. I'm more deeply committed to my Christ and to my faith than ever before. And then here's the credo. My commitment is, however, to a new understanding of both the Christ, Jesus, and Christianity. I'm increasingly drawn to a Christianity that has no separating barriers and that does not bind me into the creeds of antiquity. It's a Christianity that cannot be contained by or expressed through traditional liturgical forms. I have no desire to find certainty or to embrace religious security. I choose, rather, to live in the unbounded joy of embracing the radical insecurity that is the nature of human life, and by doing so to discover that I am, in fact, walking the Christ path. I have no desire to walk any other faith path. I've discovered that if I walk the Christ path deeply enough and far enough, it will lead me beyond anything I now know about Christianity. I see that not as a negative statement, but as a positive one. Jesus walked beyond the boundaries of his religion into a new vision of God. I think that this is what I also have done. And that is what I want to celebrate. God is ultimate, Christianity is not. Uh, God is ultimate, Christianity is not. 
this is very unsettling to people who have a very traditional understanding of the faith. And, and what he's going to do, at least he says he's going to do, is to challenge not so much the Bible in this case, but um, or at least early on, some of the creedal statements, when I say creedal, I mean the creeds of the church, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed. And Spong would say, even, those, even though those things are so foundational to the faith historically, he, Spong, is not so sure they represent or reflect the mind and the heart, the path of, of Jesus of Nazareth. And this brings us to the Gospel of John, because it's the Gospel of John itself that really forms the foundation for many of the things that we profess, for example, in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, uh, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Uh, the Nicene Creed, Jesus being of one substance with the Father, uh, begotten, not made, all of these things, um, it comes right out of the Gospel of John. So here's the logic. If Spong has a problem with these creedal statements, if he thinks these are the stumbling blocks, and B, the creedal statements are based on the Gospel of John, then C, that explains why he's had such a problem reading and understanding the Gospel of John his entire life. I'm the opposite. I love the Gospel of John, <laughs> but we can talk about that some other time. So he wants to ask this question. Can we read the Gospel of John through a new lens, as we did read the Gospel of Matthew through a new lens? And of course, Spong is going to say yes, and that's going to be the trajectory of this book, understanding the Gospel of John in a new way. So let me let me stop right there and just see if there are any questions or comments, you know, reflections on your understanding of the Gospel of John, or maybe you know passages from John. There's so many that are so good. For God so loved the world, right? In the beginning was the Word. Uh, all of those passages that are. Uh, you know, so central to the gospel. Any thoughts? Oh, Kayleen, yeah. thank you for joining us. Go ahead, Denny. Um, could you remind us of the source material that John relied on and Matthew and, um, you know, other gospel writers? Um, I don't know if it goes back to Q or back to uh, some of the um, unacknowledged uh, individuals who jotted down their thoughts that were passed yeah. on orally yeah yeah actually that's exactly where i'm going to be going next denny so you all in good scholarly fashion you anticipate uh our uh you know our, our next uh, move here um any other questions or comments i can I can tell you that my love of the Gospel of John is um, well. I have a, I have I have some ambivalence about John as well. There can be no doubt that the Gospel of John is the source, the biblical source, I should say, of of or has been used in the past to um, justify anti-Semitism, and we'll probably get into talking about that, but. John was written rather late, and by that time, followers of Jesus, who were about the time at that time being called Christians, they were being kicked out of the synagogues. The people, the Jews in the synagogues said, you know, we don't think Jesus is the Messiah, and all you want to do is talk about Jesus as the Messiah. You go your own way. And they, some of them were being pretty rough about it, right? So it makes a lot of sense that the Jews in the Gospel of John, you know, are, are kind of vilified. They are presented as the group of people who really didn't see the light, you know. Um, and of course, later centuries, they would be uh, 
uh, condemned as being Christ killers, but I, I think it's important to remember that the Romans were the Christ killers here. Uh, there were some Jews who uh, were, you know, complicit in it, but others, uh, you know, were followers of Jesus. That's one of the reasons I don't like the Gospel of John, but my personal love for the Gospel of John comes from uh, when I first started learning Greek. John is weird in a lot of ways, and Denny's asking the question that is going to bring us to John's weirdness, uh, but one of the ways it's really weird is the fact that the Greek in which it is written is what you might call pidgin Greek. It's called koine. It's koine meaning common. Uh, this is where we get our word koinonia from, you know, meaning fellowship. It's, it's the common Greek that could be used in a world that in which Greek was the lingua franca. If you were a Roman, you know, or if you're a Jew, if you wanted to do any kind of commerce in Judea in the first century, you probably did it with, with Greek. Um, and the Greek that's written in the Gospel of John is, is, you know, let's say written on a fourth grade level. Let's put it that way. Now, iron, the irony of that is that John is a gospel that soars to the heights of, you know, theological uh, abstraction, really. Um, so I started reading Greek by reading the gospel of John. Uh, we learned Greek through a method called inductive uh, pedagogy or induct the inductive me method of reading Greek. I took a summer out of my life. It was, I think, six weeks or so. And we all just started reading the Gospel of John, starting with, in the beginning was the word. And as we went along, we learned and, you know, added to our knowledge. And by the end of the summer, we had read the whole Gospel, which is quite a feat in Greek, you know. Um, but my love of Greek, which, which I still hold, and my love of John kind of went together in that respect. So if you find me uh, referring to the Greek text a little more than I did, you know, with, with Matthew, that's probably wise because it's such an easy text for a, you know, a, a novice really to read, um, but it's a good one. But Denny, uh, to get to your question, let's just remind ourselves how it is that these four gospels came to be uh, included in the New Testament, because it's important to know that there were many Gospels that were written. Uh, last count, there were 26 or so, you know, that have been found, or been we, and there are others that have been referred to that uh, uh, we don't have any extant copies of. But eventually, a, a man by the name of Irenaeus decided that there should be four Gospels, right? And that's why we have four Gospels, just kind of an arbitrary decision, really. It really was, because there are four, four winds and four directions and four corners of the earth. There have to be four Gospels. Well, the Gospels that were settled upon were called Mark, Matthew, I should, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first three of these, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are referred to as synoptic Gospels, because the story they tell is roughly the same story, you know, that begins with Jesus and his ministry and his miracles and then moves on to, you know, the, the Last Supper and his crucifixion and then the resurrection. And they appear to have known about each other. Uh, the Gospel of Mark was, was written first, and it was 70 of the Common Era that it was written. Now, this... Uh, Lynn, Chuck, Chuck, uh, your husband Chuck is is mystified by this uh, something that we talked about in our Sunday school class. Came up, so you mean that the letters of Paul were actually written before the Gospels were written, and and sometimes it's hard for people to get their head around that because we think in a linear fashion. Well, the Gospels came first. In, in the New Testament. And then, of course, Paul's letters come, you know, after Acts and everything. But yes, it's true. Paul wrote his letters um, 
within 15 or so years, or I should say 20 years after um, the, the time of the crucifixion. The problem with that is that Paul doesn't really say a whole lot about the events of Jesus' life says very little about the events of Jesus' life. So we can't get a, you know, Paul writes theology before he writes the narrative. So we can't really get a good insight into who Jesus was. Well, the gospels eventually will come along. And the first of those that was written was Mark. Uh, Mark, and, and this is from our, our previous text that we read. Uh, Spong says it quite nicely it's it's now that we need to embrace the fact that it was not until mark wrote that many of the most familiar aspects of jesus story of the jesus story are heard for the first time so 40 years after jesus dies for the first time we can we have compiled into a text some of the events of of jesus life so there's a lot that can happen in 40 years. But Mark was written first. And here's the, the text that we're often talk, we often talk about. It's referred to as the two-source hypothesis by uh, uh, biblical scholars or New Testament scholars. But it really should be referred to as the four-source hypothesis. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. Mark was written first. It appears that when Matthew sat down to write his gospel, he had Mark in front of him and basically, you know, just copied Mark down. But he had another source, which was just a, a, a text with a bunch of sayings from Jesus. And he took Mark and Q, we call Q that source for quella. Quella means source in German. So Mark and Q together formed the Gospel of Matthew. But Matthew, like a good cook or a good chef adds his own spice to the recipe, right? Yeah, these are pretty good stories, Mark and Q, but uh, what you don't understand is there's a lot about Jesus that is, is particularly Jewish that I want my readers to know about. So he includes stories and traditions that are found in no other gospel. For example, uh, the story of the wise men following a star, uh, and and coming and laying down their gifts before before Jesus, uh, the the chronology, or I should say the um, the genealogy of Jesus' life is unique to Matthew. Uh, the story of G of Peter claiming that Jesus the, is the Messiah, and and Jesus says, "Well, on that rock I am going to build my church." You know, uh, that's only in Matthew. You don't find it in the other Gospels. When we go to Luke, now the reason they're called synoptic, remember, is the general story, and sometimes you can read word for word in all three of the Gospels, the same stories. But there are some slight differences. By the time we get to Luke, which was written, I should say, Matthew wrote in 85 of the Common Era. Mark was 70. Luke came after Matthew, probably around 95 or so. And he did he followed the same methodology. He had Mark somehow in front of him, and he had this source that we hypothesize was a source. You might remember from our previous books, Fong doesn't like this idea of the Q source, but this is the, the standard uh, uh, approach that many scholars have taken. Luke had Mark and Q in front of him, but then he said, you know, my audience really needs a little extra understanding. And, and Luke was writing to a Gentile Christian audience. And so he said, I'm going to draw on some traditions that these stories have left out. Now, where those traditions come from, we really don't know. But remember, Luke was an associate of Paul, and maybe they come through Paul. But if they were from Paul, then why didn't Paul include them in any of his letters or anything like that? But Luke says, I'm going to I'm going to sprinkle my stew with a little bit of spice that's more Gentile than Jewish. And so he adds material from a source that we just simply refer to as L, the Lucan material. For example, the story of anybody, not the wise men, but 
the shepherds, you know, and lo, they were sore afraid and they were watching their, sh or their flocks by night. The story of the Good Samaritan, for example, is in Luke and in no other gospel. Some other parables are in Luke and, and no other gospel. The story of Jesus being left at the temple or, or you know, and, and his mom and dad can't find him. That's only in Luke as well. Um, so the synoptic gospels tell the same general story, but if they were food, they would all be flavored differently. Mark basically would be kind of a bland oatmeal, right? Matthew would be would take that oatmeal and add some brown sugar and then some distinctively Jewish spices. I can't think of anything right now <laughs> that's that's distinctively Jewish. Luke would take that oat, uh, that same oatmeal and add some more Gentile spice to it as well. So any questions about that? For some of you, this is so such old hat that I even hesitate to to bring it up, but, but it's always good to be reminded of these things. So any any comments or questions? Well, um, I will say that Matthew focuses on Jesus as the Messiah. Luke is going to be one who's going to use a distinctively Gentile term, Jesus as Savior. Uh, and Luke writes to a Gentile Christian audience, Matthew to a Jewish Christian audience. But where does that leave us? Well, that leaves us with one gospel left, and the gospel of John. And I wanted to include this, this visual from the book of Kells, uh, which was probably, uh, it, it's known as an illuminated manuscript, but it was the four gospels, as well as some other material, but, but, but with these incredibly complex illuminations that uh, a lot of what we now call Celtic knots, and was written probably near the Isle, Isle of Iona, uh, in S Scotland and present-day England. But one of the front pieces uh, of the gospel uh, or the book of Kells includes this imagery of the four gospel writers. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. Matthew, uh, and, and I should say these images really come from a vision that Ezekiel had uh, the prophet Ezekiel, when he saw the, the wheel in the skies, the wheels turning in the sky and these, these beings that were on each side of the, this, if you know that crazy uh, drug-induced, it's almost drug-induced hallucinogenic uh, or hallucination that, that Ezekiel has, he sees these creatures what, that have a face of a man, the face of a, a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. Well, later Christian writers came to say, oh, that, that was a, a, a premonition or prefiguration or prophecy even that would later find its uh, culmination and fulfillment in the four gospels. Ezekiel was writing probably somewhere in the middle of the fifth or sixth century BCE. But Christians adopted this imagery. The gospel of Matthew is seen as portraying Jesus as a man. The Gospel of Mark portrays Jesus as the Lion of Judah, you know, and so here's the lion image. Luke sees Jesus as a sacrificial uh, being, an entity, uh, and as represented by the ox. And then finally, the Gospel of John uh, that soars in, you know, the heights of theological uh, abstraction uh, is represented by the eagle. So the eagle and the Gospel of John are almost seen as, you know, are, are seen as almost synonymous. And it's it's really true. There's something about the beauty of the Gospel of John that that rises above uh, the other three Gospels. And it's a completely different Gospel. Uh, and, and I would even venture to say tells a different story. For example, I've already told you that it was written in Koine Greek, whoever wrote this uh, probably didn't know Greek very well. And Spong is gonna talk about this, so I won't uh, 
you know, belabor the point uh, so much here, but probably didn't know Greek very well. And Denny, I'm not answering your question on what were, what were the sources. We're not really sure, but one of the sources uh, scholars have called a signs source. There was circulating before the time of, well, after the time of Jesus and before the time of the Gospel of John being written, a source about uh, that that talks about Jesus and uh, giving certain signs as to his, you know, his glorification, as to who he was. The Gospel of John begins with the assumption that Jesus is God, just right from the start, you know. But I, I'm I'm getting ahead of myself. Some peculiarities about it. It's only in the Gospel of John that we see Jesus having a ministry that lasts three years. Uh, the Synoptic Gospels don't really talk about how long Jesus' ministry was, uh, but we do know in the Gospel of John that he goes up to Jerusalem for the feasts of, you know, various feasts in Jerusalem at least three times, meaning three years of, you know, of that journey taking place. And so we've just, we've come to say, if you you ask, you know, a school school child, how long did Jesus, you know, live or how long did he uh, minister? They, they would say, well, it was three years. It's just become kind of common knowledge. He had been from the time he was baptized to the time he died, about three years. Now, the chronology of events in the Gospel of John and the events themselves are quite different. Um, for example, you all know the story about Jesus turning over the table of the money changers, right? When did that happen in the chronology of Jesus' life? Well, we've already seen when we were reading the last part of Spong's book on Matthew, that this was a part of the Passover, uh, the events of Passover during the last week of Jesus' life. If we read this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and I'm now I'm not I'm wondering if that's in Mark. I don't think it's in Mark. But anyway, if you were to read it in the Synoptic Gospels where the story appears, Jesus, you know, sees the money changers in the temple and he upsets the money changers and lets the doves loose and, and things like that. Um, it comes at the end of his of his career. But if you read it in the Gospel of John, guess where it appears? Chapter two. Chapter two of the Gospel of John. This is an introductory, uh, you know, motif. This is an introduction to Jesus in the Gospel of John. Um, so the chronology of events is 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 skewed. It, it really we can't really because of the Gospel of John and the Synoptics having different chronologies. We can't really say that there is history as we know it being written. It's being written with some sort of um, intention in mind. In the Gospel of John, interestingly enough, how did Jesus teach in Matthew? Remember that whole section after uh, the Feast of Dedication, or no, between Sukkot and the Feast of Dedication, where Jesus just like telling parable after parable after parable in Matthew, guess what? No parables in John, <laughs> not a single one. The distinctive form of Jewish teaching that Jesus used so well, find it throughout the synoptics, you don't see it in the Gospel of John, which raises some interesting questions. In the Gospel of John, pers you know, technically there are no miracles. They're not referred to as miracles. The, the focus is on signs. Every time Jesus does something extraordinary, like feeds a, a, a large group of people, the um the gospel writer you know he's 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 writing after the event he's kind of looking back on it and and saying we didn't know it at the time but this was a sign of his you know the glorification that he was going to go through and speaking of glorification remember how important the whole transfiguration when jesus goes up to the mountain on Mount Tabor, and he's got Peter, James, and John with him. And all of a sudden, he's enveloped in this bright light, 
And to one side, he's got Moses, and the other side, he's got Elijah. And Peter says, this is great. Let's stay up here forever. And Jesus says, no, no, we, you know, that's, that's not the purpose of this. We have, to, we have to go back down and be about our ministry. But Jesus is, is transfigured, right? He, he's, he's bathed in this wonderful light. And for Matthew, particularly, when we look at our previous book, that becomes a, a central affirmation of who Jesus was. Jesus was the new temple. You know, this was central to the, um, the story that Matthew was telling. Guess what? That central <laughs> feature of the synoptics does not appear in the Gospel of John. You would think something so important uh, you know, to the other three gospels would at least get be given a mention in the gospel of John. It's not. And to add insult to injury, there's another event that's so central to the other gospels, the Last Supper. You know, the Last Supper that we know so well, where Jesus breaks the bread and pours the wine. This is my body. This is my blood poured out for you. And the new covenant, not present in the gospel of John. There is a supper. It's not clear that it's a Passover supper, but Jesus does something very distinctive at this supper towards the end of the gospel. He gets down on his knees and wraps a, you know, a towel around himself and then washes his disciples' feet. Uh, and this was you know, the, the significant event prior to his, his crucifixion. But there's no sense that Jesus breaks bread, uh, and pours wine, no riding into, uh, you know, Jerusalem, and, and uh, I better be sure of, about what I'm saying, but I, I, no, yes, there is, there, but there's no sense of the Last Supper as a Passover meal in the Gospel of John. Um, a foot washing takes place, you can read that, about that, in chapter 13 of, of John. Let me let me stop. I, I feel like sometimes I just go on talking forever and maybe somebody, but please feel free to jump in and just say, hey, Dan, wait, I got a question. Any comments or questions? Dan, I'm always fascinated by why people wrote certain things down and why maybe in the case of any of the writers of the Gospels, they might have figured, well, everybody already knows that. It's already a story that everyone's familiar with. So I'll write things that perhaps are on my mind and are unique. I mean, how, how do we kind of work with their worldview or their mindset at that time about well, why that, people communicated the way they did? Yeah, that's a very good point, because there may be there may, may be some common knowledge among the followers of Jesus that these gospels are an addition to. Right. And well, everybody knows this and maybe. You know, we don't really need to, to talk too much uh, about that. But the one, one thing that is clear is that it's about the audience. The audience needs to whom these gospels are being written. When the gospel writers are writing, if, if there is, in fact, a single person writing, there mostly it would, would be a community tradition that develops that, that finally gets, you know, uh, written down. But they're writing for a very specific group of people, for a very specific context. And Matthew's community, though very close to John's community geographically, is going to have a different uh, focus altogether. Um, but the, the question you ask is one that I think is, is really the most intriguing, to which we don't have any answer, <laughs> because... Uh, if there was assumed knowledge, it is, is certainly passed away. And of course, the biblical knowledge or the gospel knowledge that we have here is, is what is, is primary. Um, but early on after Jesus' ministry, there were oral traditions. People weren't writing it, things down, even probably at the time of Paul. Why? Because they thought the world was going to end. They thought Jesus was coming back very, very soon. Jesus even said so. I tell you truly, there are some standing here among you today who will not pass away before they see the kingdom of God come in glory. Well, they passed away. The next generation passed away. And the next generation passed away. And, and finally, 
after the tumultuous events of 70 of the Common Era, when the temple was destroyed, uh, and the followers of Jesus were removed or you know kicked out of the synagogues, uh, they started to, uh, to to write these things down. The oral traditions were not enough. They they were really in a very vulnerable uh, situation. So that's probably what prompted the writing of these these gospels. What common knowledge they had beforehand, we don't know. It's hard to know. Um, let me let me tell you about the one thing that's very surprising that uh, students were always aghast at. But uh, the Gospel of John presents a real problem for people who think that the 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 Bible is history. I've actually heard preachers say the Bible is the most historically accurate document that has ever been written, you know, and why they need to say that, I have no idea, but it's, it's not history. There wasn't a conception of history when it's been written. And then you have to explain this. If you believe that, that is historically accurate, you have to explain this anomaly. In the Gospel of John, the central event one of the central events of the Christian tradition, the crucifixion, happens on a day that's different from the day identified in the other three Gospels. The other three Gospels, Jesus dies on the Passover. He's executed on the Passover. In the Gospel of John, he is executed, he's crucified on the day before the Passover. And there are very clear reasons why John wants to portray Jesus in this way. If you get caught up in the historicity of this, your, your, your faith is going to fall apart if you think that, you know, uh, what you're reading is an accurate account of events as they occurred. They occurred. And Spong is going to make this clear to us. Uh, you know, try to try to set that aside and and as he says, walk the Christ path in which um, uncertainty is is the norm. So I've got, uh, uh, I want to, any comments about that? Does anybody feel a little bit unsettled by that? I'll tell you, I have students talking to me after class when they hear that one. You can't possibly, well, they were, they were the same day, they were just called different things and you know, trying to do all kinds of mental gymnastics to come up with some way to, to ensure that their Bible is right. Um, but probably the biggest difference when we compare John to the synoptics is this, is that from the very start, John assumes that Jesus is God. If you read the other gospels, uh, when Jesus is referred to, you know, as the son of man or, or son of David, or sometimes even son of God, that, that did not mean that he was God. You know, there were emperors at this time who were being referred to as son of God, being part man, part God, right? John is going to be the first one that says, uh-uh, no, this guy is God right from the start, you know? Uh, he, he is not a, you know, a demigod, uh, part man, part human. He is fully God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and all things were made through him. Jesus is that word. He existed with God even before creation. Now, this is monumental in 100 of the common era when the gospel of John is being written. There is one community who's already made the leap to say that Jesus was with God in the beginning, that he is this pre-existent being who was not only present before creation, but is the one through whom creation came into existence. Um, and you can see references to this in the Gospel of John. Um, and they're really beautifully veiled. But but in the Gospel of John, you always see Jesus making these I am statements. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine, and you are the branches, you know. Uh, and if, you, if you're if you aware of, of where that word I am comes from, that is the name of Yahweh, 
that's what Yahweh means. I am, or I will be whatever I will be. And so John holds fast to this idea that Jesus is God. And all of those I am sayings are just simply a, a means of affirming this, you know, that God who is with in that person who is with God in the beginning becomes incarnate, uh, becomes a, a man. So you have this incredible paradox of the infinite becoming becoming finite. And this would be the thing that the people writing the creeds a hundred years later, 200 or so, 300 or so, they were going to try to figure out how can Jesus be God and man at the same time? He, was he just part God, part man? Uh, you know, and, and how, how could we, you know, worship a God who is one, but then affirm that Jesus uh, is, is, is God. I mean, so did, did God come down completely out of heaven and become Jesus? So who was manning heaven and, and abiding heaven, you know, while Jesus was on earth, you know, all these questions really uh, start to, to come to be asked and, and they, they get answered in the Nicene Creed holy God, fully human, uh, God from God, true light from true light, all of, all of these things. Um, John is the one who really sets that ball rolling. And this is why Spong has such a hard time with John, right? Or he used to, he said, because he had such a hard time with the creedal statements out of which, you know, that, that were, were, he has such a hard time with the creedal statements that were brought out of, you know, a reflection on the Gospel of John. But when you look at that prologue, it really, when I say the prologue, I'm talking about John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things through him were made. Not one thing that is made was, you know, on and on, and then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, this is where the study of Greek is so beautiful, and I'll leave you with this. And this is where I just, I personally just was put on fire to, to learn more. You know, in the first week that we were studying Greek, we read, the word became flesh, the logos, the logos, the word became flesh, sarks, and dwelt among us. Well, the word dwelt in Greek, eskenosen is, is the Greek word, but it doesn't mean to simply dwell like, oh, I'm going to inhabit this place. You know what it means literally? The word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. Look at how beautiful that is. First of all, it, it harkens back to the presence of God in the tabernacle in the time of, of Moses, right? But it also gives us a sense of, you know, what it means to live in a tent. I mean, that's not a very stable dwelling. Can you imagine God taking on human flesh? Yeah, that's like living in a tent, you know. You are, you're about as close to the elements and close to disasters and tragedies and everything else. But that's what the prologue wants to, to emphasize here. The God who was eternal in the beginning takes on this very finite and, and vulnerable form. Uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us so that we may behold his glory. Um, and so that's, when I read that in Greek, I said, ah, yes, this, I, I need to know what these words originally meant because the word became flesh and dwelled among us. No, nah, that doesn't really say much to me. The word became flesh and lived as a vulnerable being in a flimsy structure known as a tent. <laughs> yeah, there is a lot of, there's a dynamic to that that I can do a lot with. And that gives me insight into, um, you know, this statement. And this prologue, John 1, 1 through 14, was probably an early creedal statement. This is what we believe about Jesus. He's God, became incarnate. And I'll just leave you with this. It also reflects something that we see in um, Paul's letter, Paul's letter to the Philippians, Philippians chapter two, where Paul is writing this letter, and all of a sudden he kind of waxes eloquent and and 
and moves into this statement that sounds kind of like an I believe statement as well. God, who, though he was, or Jesus, though he was one with God, did not count uh, oneness with God as something to be grasped or something to be exploited, but emptied himself and took on the form of a slave. God emptying himself and taking on the form of a servant, you know, so that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bend and every, I, I can't, I don't have it all memorized there. But if you read it in Philippians, it sounds very much like this idea of incarnation, the word, you know, emptying itself and becoming vulnerable, the infinite becoming finite, you know, the eternal becoming temporal and dwelling among, among us and taking on the form of, of a servant. And so John is really got all kinds of, of wonderful metaphors and, uh, you know, stories that we're going to be able to look at with the help of Spong. And I think with that introduction, I can probably give you your assignment of reading. Let's just start with chapters one and two. And you could probably go all the way to, to page 29, but if you know me, I, it will take a year for us to get through this book. Um, so, Dan, can I mention something before yes, we Yes, please, please. Since I have read this book some yeah. years ago, I'm anxious to reread it oh, again. Good. But one of the things I think is important, and I'll say as, I guess, advice to people that are going to dive into this book, the title of it is Tales of a Jewish Mystic. Now, we're all familiar enough with Spong after our last book to know how important it is that he emphasizes the Jewish nature of the author or authors. But equally important to Spong, as I recall, is the concept, which I think is newer, at least it was to me, that it's important that he sees the author as a mystic. Right. That's not just a word that's thrown in there. That's yeah. important, I think. <clears throat> I think maybe, yeah, thank you. I think given that, next time I'll I'll try to unpack what that means exactly. Um, you know, I, I you might have a general sense of what it means, but uh, there is a mystical tradition that would have been, you know, developing at this time uh, known as the Kabbalah uh, that may have some relevance here, but mysticism in general, we could talk about that uh, as we start next time. That that helps me to know where to begin, Mac. So thank you. And please, Mac, don't. I know you've read this book. Don't hesitate to jump <laughs> in. I, you could teach this class. I mean, my goodness, yeah. you really could. So you're 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 leaving us all in great uh well we just i just wish you would you know give us give us your insights uh more often because i know you've got good ones as you all do will you want to say something oh i just wanted to say thank you also to mac and to you dan mm -hmm. yeah looking sure. forward to this next five years <laughs> <laughs> right. No. That's how long it's going to take? Is that what you're saying? This will be fun. <laughs> no, it, I'll, we'll probably work through it a little more quickly. So, right. okay. Well, I think with that, I'm going to stop the share here, and um, I will see all of you uh, next time. And and thank you so much for sticking with us. And please invite your friends and anyone who wants to learn a little more. It's good to see you all. See you next Wednesday. <laughs>